Boy, if you, you ever went go to the Lost Boys, Boys? Or not. I would. I always no, go straight I would, to Lost you, Boys. That's Santa. That's Santa Carla. Carla. Let's let's be but straight. It was Santa, Santa Carla. Yeah, it was filmed in Santa Cruz. I don't but believe it's Santa you. Carla. The, the I've dude been with there. The, the dude with the, I, the dude with the I saxophone. Have... The saxophone is in Santa Carla. Hi, I'm Cami Chaos, and I'm Rick Tarosi. We're mildly interesting people, but this week. This week, we have a guest, and she is a wildly interesting person. She's a fourth-generation Cleveland Guardians fan who hates the Yankees. I mean, there's a fair amount of that going around. Uh, She has a tendency to crochet inappropriate phrases. Not crochet. Cross-stitch. I don't know what I'm even talking about right here. No, crochet them. (laughs) Can you? Can you crochet? Okay, well, if you if you learn maybe how, maybe a I'd nice really owl, that. something like that would be great. Superb how, owl. Is an, how is an owl inappropriate? Oh, that's macrame. Sorry, that I was I was even into another. I do macrame. Okay, mm. let's I was get just back to the a introduction. Joke. <laughs> let's get back to the introduction with one of her best friends. She oversees the largest database of queer, transgender, and non-binary women in television in scripted television um, but they're branching out right now and she has a tendency to make her friends cry and i know because she's one of the closest friends that i have um everyone i would like to introduce you to the lovely the charming the talented the vulgar mika epstein i i think the only thing i can i can go is hey i'm i don't know that i'm a superbly interesting person (laughs) I'm mildly interesting, depending on who's who's watching and listening. But yeah, that that's that is absolutely me, and I do not mean to make her cry, Rick. I'm so sorry. It's fine. I it's find good. you it's wildly interesting. Me. Yeah. Oh, Rick is saying that. Thank you. And, and that's why we, that's why we set the bar low with mildly interesting. So you don't you don't need to worry about being any anything more than that. Um, it's our job to draw out those interesting points from you. Uh, So I, uh, given that you are such close friends, I know you talk on a regular basis. I'm not privy to a lot of that (laughs) Slack chat. We text. But yeah. yeah. But we we, we have, we have verbal communication in an emergency situation or when we really need to talk shit. I mean, Kimmy talked me down from a panic attack. So, you know, our friendship is uh, very large and encompassing. Where did it begin? Was it the same WordCamp US? Or I'm sorry, the same WordCamp San Francisco that you and Tracy founded LesWatch? I think it was. We went out to uh, breakfast. We went out to like a brunch. Yeah. With, uh... So 2013. Yeah. yeah. Oh my That's... God, our friendship is 10 years old. Happy birthday, friendship. <laughs> Happy birthday, friendship. <laughs> uh, I was with a then friend who invited me out to meet the new employee at uh, automatic yeah no that's what happened you had just oh my started gosh. I, I was brand new I you was were a few brand months new. into yeah. my i was a few months into my gig yeah yeah and uh yeah. i have absolutely no idea why i was brought along on that lunch just happened to be friends with two people who cammy happened to work with and cammy and i kind of hit it off and we started chatting as those casual friends but i remember that the, the turning point and when I thought I have to be her actual friend friend is that I was searching a WordPress thing for my name and I kept getting Cami Chaos instead of Mika because <laughs> <laughs> see how her name is M-I-K-A in there. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, oh, right, that's this Cami person that I met. And I was like, OK, well, now we just have to be friends. And that's the end of that. And uh, it stuck. And on, that's awesome. On my end, I just. I thought Mika was way too cool for to be friends with me. So it was a little, I had some, I had some self doubt and reservation. I was like, she's so cool. Cammy and, and so my smart. wife are literally the only people who think I'm that cool. <laughs> Everybody else. <laughs> you know what? Like, yeah, I, you're an interesting person. I don't, I never got cool in school ever. We are smart. I was weird. We're smart. We know. Well, I'm a little <laughs> weird too. So yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. We, um, we have a lot yeah. in common. We're born in the same year. Uh, like if you do a Venn diagram, the overlap is actually not that huge, but it's so adjacent. Like, and it's, and strangely specific things. Yeah. Like very yeah. oddly specific things that we have overlap on. Uh, and it just, when you started the, our, our little private book club thing. We have a and private book club. Yeah. It, book. it helped us get through the pandemic. Well, we started it. You started it before the pandemic. You just announced to me one day I've made a book club and you're in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I can be a little bossy. And, and I said, okay. <laughs> and then since then the people in that club, like, if it wasn't for them, I don't know that I would have made it through the pandemic, the, the lockdown part. We were having yeah. uh, uh, one hour chats, the group of us every third, or every Wednesday, every Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, yep. And it, it really saved me, I think, because like there was a, I had been traveling, like going out of the country, traveling for work almost every month for, you know, that time, eight years. And I didn't know how to be home all the time. And now I do. And now I'm like, I don't <laughs> want to travel all the time. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Although I am the, I mean, I'm the person though. I get up every morning, I put on work clothes and I go to work. I don't work in my pajamas. I don't work in sweats. A WordCamp t-shirt is fine because I work in WordPress. So it doesn't really matter. But like, I'm still, I have my office. It is its office. When I leave this room, I stop thinking about the office. Um, mind you, that's in part because I have a phenomenal job with wonderful humans that I like quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, no, I just, she pulled me into her circle and it's very comfy here. So when did we <laughs> start doing the texting thing? I'm trying to remember, cause I know it was the middle of the pandemic and I can't remember why we started doing that. But like it was late one night and I had a random thought, so I texted it to you. And, yeah. and after that, that the floodgates, then there was like, just always texting. Like every night, basically, one of us thinks of something funny and texts it to the other person. Sometimes it's like I was watching Family Feud, which I don't understand the rules of, by the way. <laughs> I just like watching it and shouting out wrong there, answers. There are um, really oh my god, I know rules. the rules. Yeah. I know the rules. Oh, do they make sense? Oh, I no, no. But oh, I love that. Okay, um, but like, or we're watching. I'm watching Jeopardy, or I'm watching just something random that reminds me of something Cammy said, and I text her, and then we start laughing about it. Uh, a lot of our conversation involves Snoop Dogg gifts, though, and Cheech and Chong, and Cheech and Chong. And what do they have? What do they have in common? What do they have in common? I have this oh, wonderful Snoop Dogg Funko Pop Snoop that Cammy gave me. He sits on my desk. He's allowed to come out of the box. You know, you can free him from his plastic jail. You don't have I to, have, but you can. I know this is a this is a podcast and not a vodcast, but if you looked oh. over to the right hand side, it is just like a stack of papers because I have not organized that side of my life yet. <laughs> also, I, Snoop I Dogg is sitting on top of it. I haven't noticed. Snoop Dogg is in his box still. And I'm just He's, letting Mika know that okay. Snoop Dogg can come out of his box. I'm one of those people, like, I, I respect people who collect toys and collectibles. But, like, if I get a toy, I'm going to play with it. That is my only Funko Pop. I do not collect. In fact, I've actually, like, divested. I got rid of so many collections. I think I have the my favorite G.I. Joes from when I was a kid, which is basically Scarlet, Snake Eyes, and Storm Shadow. Um, oh, excellent collection. I have a yep. collection of Napoleonic-era toy soldiers that was a gift from uh, my Uncle Arthur. I need to like put those in a frame sort of situation and have it hanging on the wall. But uh, like the only other things I have that are like collectibles are like my posters. Like I have like behind my head, I have a poster of Nichelle Nichols, which I adore. And on either side of her that you cannot see are Xena live posters from a performance I saw. But like, <laughs> I, I, oh, Xena live, man, that was an epic thing. You guys have no idea. And it's not been recorded. So it exists in my memory and the memory of all of us who've seen it. But uh, Chicago, there was this theater that decided they were going to do a live production of a Xena episode. And Why not? The first, well, right. But, uh, the problem with the second one was that after they got to that point and Xena was dead, like 
the series ends in Zena. I'm sorry, this is a spoiler for anybody who hasn't watched. Wait, what? Zena's dead. Zena's dead? <laughs> yes, and from ancient New Greaseland, she has passed away. Um, we always called it ancient New Greaseland because they filmed in New Zealand as Greece, and it really looks nothing like it. The second one was really hard because they're like, well, Zena's dead. How are we going to explain this? And so the whole intro, and it's a musical, and they they say, what if we take this video cassette and this videotape and we merge them together? And all of a sudden you find out that the person who's organizing this whole thing is actually uh, Alti, a witch who was one of Zena's nemesises. And this will always be in my memory, is that she's saying, did you forget about me? Where are the fans of Alti to the tune of uh, Alanis Morissette's song? And my wife and I are at one of the performances and she said, where are the fans of Alti? And my wife and I immediately shout, we're right here. <laughs> and I felt so bad afterwards, but we we saw that like three or four times. We just, it was eight bucks to go and see it. Why would we not? But it was right. so funny. And jokes from that are like, if you ever hear me go, no, let's take the long way. I'm actually shouting back to that play. It, it just, yeah, no, nah, some things just stick with you forever and good friends like good plays stick with you forever. And see that is there. apparently how I make Kimmy cry is that she's a good friend. And I thank her for things like, Talking me down from a oh panel. boy, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, before hey, it, before it goes your, off the rails, I'm supposed to be the mildly interesting person, not Cammy, but here I am talking it's up Cammy because she's awesome. Sorry. We're the we're the, we're the mildly interesting <laughs> people. So we have <clears throat> touched on. It's interesting, like GI Joe, Family yes. Feud. You've touched yep. on Xena. TV Jeopardy. clearly Jeopardy. clearly plays a role in your life. I think this would be a great place to start talking about Les Watch TV. Tell us more about that project. Les Watch TV is the brainchild of myself and one of my best friends, Tracy Levesque, uh, who at the same event where I met Cammy. Uh, good event. Good event. Uh, Tracy <laughs> Solid. decided. Solid event. Tracy decided she was going to be my friend and that I was an interesting person. So I guess I really have to just suck it up. And I am interesting to some people. Um, <laughs> and we got to talking about the things that we both liked. And as it turned out between the two of us, we had a ridiculous amount of knowledge of queer women on television at the time. We were only talking about lesbians, and sometimes we joke about how uh, biphobic we accidentally made the site at first. But uh, tisk tisk tisk. Hey, we we've learned. We fixed it. Broadened our horizons, it. and <laughs> Les Watch TV L E Z W A T C H TV dot com is the home of the world's greatest lesbian, transgender, and non-binary characters on international television. This includes all scripted TV, uh, web series, and streaming. So, you know, Netflix shows, absolutely, but also streaming shows. Uh, and I'm going to pick Anyone But Me, which is a phenomenal web series if you've ever seen it. It's got some actors that you're going to go and go, hey, wait, I know that person. Uh, they've since moved on to become pretty well known. And, you know, if I get to joke back to Xena, um, the actress in Xena, Alexandra Billings, who is insanely famous. Like, if you think Alexandra Billings, why do I know her? If you've seen a trans woman on TV in regular scripted TV in the last five or ten years, it's possibly her. She was just, like, the person. She's been on um, How to Get Away with Murder, Transparent. Uh, what was she on just recently? She was on uh, the Connors, the Roseanne reboot. Mm. Like she just, she's all around. And I've got her autograph uh, because she was in Xena Live One: Double Your Pleasure, which was about Xena being split <laughs> into Lover Xena and Fighter Xena. And Alex Billings played Fighter Xena, and she was so good. But uh, that's like my first experience with her. Um, but all of that came actually right into Les Watch because we're like, well, okay. Here we have Zena. She was gay, queer. Zena didn't care. Zena had not, Zena was mm -hmm. the prototypical pansexual over there. Um, and 
Tracy and I <laughs> built out this site where we listed all the characters from the TV shows, all their actors, and she and I built this entire massive database. It's built in WordPress. All the code is open source, so if somebody wants to make a, a male version for uh, predominantly gay male television, please take the code and run. I, I would love to see what you do. Um, I just don't want to watch all of Queer as Folk again. <laughs> I liked Queer as Folk, the British version, and I kind of liked the American version, but American versions of TV shows go on so long sometimes, and like they need yeah. to accept that there is an end and actually have an ending. I'm looking at you, warrior nun. I have a question for you. <laughs> I, have a, I have a technical question for you. Talk to me, please, about how okay. Sarah Lance messed up everything. <laughs> God. Sarah Lance. Sarah Lance. Please okay, enlighten so, our audience. Who's Sarah Lance? Sarah Lance is a character in the Arrowverse. The Arrowverse is, was, actually, it's ending now, um, a suite of shows that were on the CW back before it got bought out the second time. Um, and they were all DC superheroes, like all DC superheroes. The first one they did was the green arrow where they told the story of Oliver queen. And then they did the flash told the story of this guy who runs really fast. I don't actually like the flash. I'm sorry, everybody. I just, I can't get he into can, the he fact can that there's only superpowers running. He can vibrate at a high frequency, running. too. No, he can vibrate. He can vibrate and move through things I mean, from time to time. And, and, you know, maybe I should be more appreciative of that. I don't know. <laughs> um, but then they, then they made this show called Legends of Tomorrow. And it's Legends so of Tomorrow, Legends of Tomorrow is such a weird show. Speaking of shows that didn't get proper endings, by the way. Um, and the as all oh yeah yeah legends of tomorrow is the most comic book like of all the superhero shows that the cw ever produced like uh a male character was impregnated by an alien and had to give birth through his nose yep that happened uh but sarah lance was originally on uh green arrow she was one of oliver's random Friends with benefits. They yeah. weren't really dating. They were just hooking up. <laughs> um, and Sarah Lance dies. And then <laughs> Sarah, La and then Sarah Lance is resurrected by this thing called a Lazarus pit, which if you're a real DC nerd, you know what, what that's about. Um, and she ended up becoming an assassin. Because the assassin. It's a, Sarah, she, Hey, she's an undead assassin. And yeah. because Sarah Lance had died, this guy, uh, Rip Hunter decided, I need a collection of superheroes and legendary people who nobody will miss if they go missing. Well, Sarah Lance was dead. Now she's back. Nobody will miss her. Um, and he took them time traveling on adventures to save the timeline and prevent horrible things from happening. But the problem here is that Sarah Lance died and came back. And so on our database, we actually list out when a character dies. Normally, this is a one-time event. <laughs> Sarah Lance has died or been presumed dead over 15 times. So hmm. first of all, I had to figure out how to make death, the date of death, a repeating field. <laughs> when I really hadn't ever thought I'd need to. Uh, I had to figure out how do I... Uh, I built this system in that that uh, gives shows a score. Uh, it's just a, a number value between zero and a hundred of how mm -hmm. how good is this show, and it takes into account how many queers do you have, how many are played by queers, uh, do you do good things with these queers, like uh, do they have happy endings, is there a big gay wedding, and then it checks things like are these just queers of the week though? So like ER has you know a bunch of queers, but I don't. They shouldn't be rewarded for that more than the L word that had 61 queer women, transgender or non-binary on the original show. And I keep thinking that number must be low, but we, we, we require you to have a name or lines. And sadly, a lot of people on the L word were just a random lesbian with no lines that slept with Shane. I actually had that be an I mean, auto fill. A lesbian who slept, slept with Shane. Shane. Yeah. Gosh, Shane slept with everybody. Yeah. Um, but 
Oh, it's shame. Sarah Lance. I we shame. had shame was hot though. What I mean. I know. No, it's fair. I'm not, I'm not uh, arguing. Sarah, that so Shane let's see. Sarah wasn't Lance hot. was on The Flash. She was on um, uh, Green Arrow. She was on Legends of Tomorrow. They added a new show, Supergirl. She was on that. Add another new show, Batwoman. She was on that. You name a show in the Arrowverse. Sarah Lance has been on it. So basically, hmm. everything that became super complicated. How do I list this many shows? How do we list when they're on this show? Because that actually matters. You know, you want to know, oh, I don't need to watch all these episodes if I want to see Sarah Lance and um, Alex Danvers hook up at a wedding. I want this episode. And yes, that happened. It was great. We all loved it. Um, but and then Katie, Katie Lotz is a Katie Lotz plays Sarah Lance and she's amazing, but you know, it it just factored in. Oh wait, there was another actor who played her originally in one scene, so we had to add that. And essentially, the heart of the database, the way that we had to build how it inter- interconnects in a way that was friendly to visitors and also was not going to crash my server every time. Uh, it, that took a lot. It was hmm. yeah, that was the. She was the most difficult thing I had to solve. The second most difficult thing was a very hilarious moment where every single character we had added for uh, Orphan Black showed up as being played by Tatiana Maslany. And that's only funny (laughs) if you've seen the show and you know that Tatiana Maslany (laughs) plays like eight separate characters on that show. But she was not playing all of the queers. And I was like, I've broken something. So... Uh, if you ever happen to look through our code and you see this big document section in the code that, that lists out uh, the Sarah Lance complex, complexity, the Tatiana Maslany override, um, every time a, a specific actor or character causes something to break, um, I name the problem for them and document it. Mostly so that like later me doesn't go back and think, I'm smarter than I used to be. I can fix this. No, there was a reason we did this, and it's because of Sarah Lance. Usually that is code. the answer. Very important. I, Documenting code, Sarah Lance. Yeah. yeah. I document amusingly, I've been told. You do. Uh, I find you. that to be accurate. And with vulgarities. So is, I apologize, Mom. <laughs> so is She's it not just... not really sorry, Mom. I haven't done my mom <laughs> all my research that I need to do, but is it just... Does the database just rank by score shows or do you also delve into like characters or actors who don't rank characters we certainly would never rank actors because that's just that's i don't know that just strikes me as like a way to accidentally insult somebody Mm -hmm. uh and yeah you know, even if I think an actor is terrible, and there are certain actors I think are terrible that even Cammy and my wife love, and I'm just like, I don't, I, I can't get into them. But that's a taste <laughs> issue. When we're, we're talking have about to have this conversation offline, because I'd like to know. I would too. I'm sure there's one. I just hadn't thought of one off the top of my head. Oh, um, it might okay. be men in general. I just, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I do like men. It's true. I just can't get into not them. A, not all of them, just some <laughs> no. of them, but. Um. This is, by the way, Rick, if you're wondering, <laughs> this is what conversations happen on our texts, too. <laughs> so, uh-huh. <laughs> um, the scoring system, the fun story about the scoring system is that we were going to a live taping of One Day at a Time. Uh, the revival was a live filmed show by Netflix, and I watched it at like the exact perfect time in my life that I needed it. Um, and we went to the tapings for all um, we went to like five tapings for season two i want to say and mm-hmm. uh i'm in line and i have a notebook with me because i'm doing les watch tv stuff i'm going to take <laughs> notes and write a post about this and as i'm taking notes i start mulling over this concept of how would i score a show to let people know that you know uh if you're watching a show for queer female content watch the l word if you're watching a show for queer female content, you can watch ER, but you'll want to concentrate on the Carrie Weaver seasons. Um, and I started going, well, okay, clearly we have television shows have tropes. I mean, otherwise the TV trope website would not exist. 
Uh, and we started, we collected a bunch of tropes that we see common in queer content. So, um, uh, love triangles, specifically bisexual love triangles, even though it's like really a pansexual love triangle, we use the love triangle, um, uh, dead queers, queers in law enforcement, sex workers, show takes place in prison. You know, these were actually ridiculously common tropes. There are so many shows that do this. So I started going through them and I made a list of what we called good tropes, which are happy ending, which are big gay wedding. And then bad tropes, which are takes place in prison, kills all the queers. Um, then... And the original version was really just, and then we also have this thing that we do. We say at the end, we say, this is a show we give a thumbs up, thumbs down, or a eh. And an eh is, you know, this is an okay show. It's not going to change your life. Um, and, you know, using one day at a time and as an example, is I immediately I say it's a thumbs up. Um, we have a thing called the heart flag, which is if all of us decide, and all of us is uh, me, Tracy, and Nikki, one of our writers, all decide this show is fantastic, we give it a heart. And the heart factors into the score as well, gives it bonus points. Um, but then we started factoring in how many characters are on the show, how many characters are played by queer actors on the show, because that's also really important. And then a subset of that was how many trans characters are played by trans actors. If we go yeah. back far enough, um, oh, what the heck is his name? The dad from um, uh, Brady Bunch. Here's the story. Yeah, him. Uh, he a, was. I don't know anyone's names. Man named Brady. Everyone really um, hates it when I sing. Uh, so go ahead, the, dad sorry. And, the dad in Brady Bunch, whose name has escaped me. Sorry. Uh, he's gay in real life. He was gay in real life. He ended up dying of AIDS. Uh, very tragic. But he didn't really come out because of when all this stuff was. You couldn't. I mean, it's like, well, we know about Rock Hudson, but we he never talked about it. Um, we know, but we don't know. Right. But we knew yeah. about this guy. Yeah. Um, and he plays a... He plays a, a man who is going to transition into a woman on a medical drama in like 1960 something. And like old enough that like the, the picture quality is grainy, monochromatic, doesn't really have any saturation. It's that old. Um, and in my, in my mind and in my heart, it still matters if a trans actor is playing a trans character. At the same time, I really would like to see more trans actors just play characters. Like, right. I, just because you're trans does not mean you have to only play trans characters. But at the same time, there's something about the heart of the character. How do you portray that physical awkwardness of being in what is effectively the wrong body for who you are? And I understand a small portion of that because I was gay in the 80s and recognized, oh, all of my friends who have just come from this movie are talking about how cute this boy is. I, meanwhile, saw a picture of Sigourney Weaver wearing a suit on the cover of her magazine, and I'm having an epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> She's really pretty, folks. Um, that, that, by the way, is actually 100% a true story of Southern California in the 80s of all of us at the mall. They all were talking about the dude, and I happened to see the magazine, and that's all I thought about for the day. Um, and I have you know, wonderful parents. Uh, my mother's only reason she wasn't happy that I was gay was that she knew people were going to hate me. You know, She loves me for who I am. My father was incredibly supportive. He made sure to introduce me to as many gay men Wait, as he could. Wait, you're gay? I know. Sorry. Nika! <laughs> I'm a big I feel like, lesbian, folks. I feel like this is something I should have learned at some point in our relationship. <laughs> I think the failure is mine. Yeah. Well, being gay uh, is the I think, least well, interesting thing well, about me. <laughs> and I think I yeah, think I think is. this is a this is a really great place for me to introduce just being completely transparent. Your LinkedIn is that a profile. Pun on purpose? <laughs> yeah. Your LinkedIn profile yeah. says you're a professional 
Oh yeah, it does. lesbian. And I, I have to admit, I didn't know there was like a pro am ranking in the lesbian world. Oh, yeah. Like, no, no, what, I, I, what, I went what, pro a few what years. What do you ago. have to do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you have to do to exactly become pro? I, well, I, you, uh, you have to take a test first of all. Um, <laughs> no test. It, don't awful. don't worry. Oh, I was so tempted to say it's an oral test joke, and I'm just so terrible that that was the first place I went to. I feel happy. It it um, solidifies my yeah my friendship with no, you. Uh, so actually, good job. The, the the professional lesbian um, happened because somebody was harassing me online, and he just he said you're just some lazy uh, slur, and I said, are you kidding me? I'm a professional lesbian, and. <laughs> It's one of those things that just sort of sticks in my head. And I thought it was so damn funny when I was filling in LinkedIn, everyone's like, well, you know, you should put that you're a WordPress expert. You should put this, you should put that. And I'm like, hell no, I'm putting professional lesbian. <laughs> and my thought process actually is I don't want to work for anybody who isn't okay with that. So let's just weed yeah. it out mm-hmm. from the beginning. If you're not yep. cool with me being a, a gay kid from Cleveland who loves baseball, who watches a lot of television and documents all the queer women she can find on it, we're not a good fit. And yeah. I'm happy Does to that say that we... my... Go ahead. Oh, I, was say, I was happy to say that uh, no one I've interviewed with since I've put that up there has ever... They've all been like, yeah, that's part of why we like you. You just outright, there you are. Um, and part of it also was that when I did that was a kind of a turning point on social media where up until then I had not actually my social media, you couldn't tell I was a woman. And in the WordPress world, most people knew, but it was starting to be a small problem in WordPress. And just please bear in mind, this was about 15 years ago. So it was a little before I met Cami. Um, People were starting to be kind of jerks about things. And I said, you know, how can I expect the world to change if I'm not willing to put myself there and change a little bit? If I can't, if I can't go out there and say, I am an adult lesbian with a steady job at a bank, which actually is what mm-hmm. I was at the time, uh, how are the kids going to know that it's okay to be exactly who they are? And I still kind of keep with that ethos um, when I do, when I did do uh, talks, I would introduce myself. I'd say, my name is Mika Epstein. My pronouns are she, her. I'm cis. My pronouns are just exactly what people assume they would be when they know I'm a woman. But if I can normalize just making it out there that, yes, these are my pronouns, she, her, then it's not weird if my non-binary friend says my pronouns are they, them, because I've Mm -hmm. said, Mm -hmm. this is, this is a thing. Um, and it's like it's a small thing I can do. Uh, my mom actually asked me recently, "Why do I wear a watch band with gay pride on it?" And I, I have an Apple watch band that's got the gay thing on it. And I said because I was wearing it at uh, WonderCon, which is a comic convention not too far from me. And this girl walked up to me. She couldn't have been more than fifteen, and she said, "Are you an ally or?" And I said, "I'm a lesbian." And she sat down next to me and she says. I need to I need to talk to a lesbian. I don't know how to come out to my parents. This is someone I've never met. I've never talked to her again. I immediately sat down. I, t- I spent an hour talking to her. Uh, I introduced her to a group that I was about to meet up with. And she immediately was enveloped by people who loved the same things she did, who were also queer. And that's why I do it. Because if I can... Yeah. It's the same reason Tracy and I love running Les Watch. If we change one person's life by letting them see themselves on television, it validates everything about you. Like, Mm -hmm. no offense to Rick, I've seen a hundred bearded guys on TV. What? Yeah, I can. I know. Sorry. Weird. I can count the number of Jewish lesbians on my fingers still. Right. Jewish lesbians, I should say. There are some that are closeted. And at the time that we started the site, most of them were either Willow from uh, from Buffy <laughs> or yes. uh, historical dramas in a prison camp. And yeah. it's, it's not a really good, good grouping here, folks. Um, but like Willow was the first time I recognized me in modern media. And that shouldn't be the case. 
there are so many stories that we have to tell. Um, I go back to One Day at a Time, which is about a Cuban family living in uh, up in L.A. area. And it's a single mom. The dad doesn't live with them. She was in the army. They, their grandmother lives with them. It is nothing like my life. I grew up with a single father. Yes, my cousin lived with us. But the story of family and how all of them talk to each other and love each other and fight with each other because you're family and you know where all the buttons are installed. So you know exactly which one to push to piss somebody off. Yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> if... <laughs> If I can connect with a story like that, if I can see the other side of uh, one of the characters comes out and her mother is like, I don't know how to deal with this. I love her. That hasn't changed. But in my head, I was prepping for mom of a girl who falls in love with a boy. And that's how that goes. I have to change everything. How do I do this? And Justina Machado, who the mother character, who plays the mother character, I was sobbing when I saw the episode for the first time because it, she sounded like my dad. Like, it's weird. Like, there's things he never would have said. But the heart of it reminded me of when I came out to my dad. And at the time, he was like, yeah, okay, cool. No problem. And how later, old, wasn't How old many, were you when, when that happened? When I came out to my dad, I was 19. Okay. Yeah, about 19. Yourself? Oh, oh, I was like 14. Weaver. Thank 14 you. Yeah, was when I realized I still had boyfriends. I was like, maybe I'm bi. Um, yeah. I, I knew I was queer when I was 14, for sure. Um, when I was 17, 18, I was in college at 17, but that's just because my birthday is in May. Um, I did not skip a grade anybody. I just had a weirdly placed birthday. Same. Uh, yeah, same with me. Yeah, I turned 18 later. Um, but... When I was 17, 18, and I'm in college, and I was, re- and my roommate had a boyfriend, and I walked in on them because, <laughs> you know, it's college, accidents happen, the sock fell off the doorknob, not her fault. Um, and she and I started chatting. She's like, you know, you could bring your boyfriends. And it like clicked in my head in boyfriends. that moment. I didn't want to. I didn't. And then she was the first person I actually came out to, Heather was. I, I said, I don't think I want to have a boyfriend. I had one more boyfriend after that, uh, Jacob. He and I are so casual friends um but after that i realized no and then i kissed a girl and i was like yep this is it (laughs) and uh after i dropped out of college i'm sorry i'm a dropout uh and i moved to chicago to be with my dad at the time uh i told him we were walking home from dinner and i and and i say this and i said my dad and i were holding hands i'm 19 ish and i'm holding hands with my dad because that was something he and i did until he died it just was normal for us uh we were very close and i tell him dad i'm i'm gay and he's like yeah i know and i i remember telling him you piece of crap why didn't you tell me um (laughs) but he said he's known my whole life and my uncle said he knew my whole life like my my adoptive uncle he's not really my blood uncle but Uh, He was my dad's best friend when my dad moved out to California and he became an uncle that I miss as much as I miss my dad. Um, Arthur said he he met me and he turned to my dad and he says, you know that this kid's going to be gay, right? (laughs) And I'm like, I was six. (laughs) I was six and I was playing with my GI Joes and my stuffed lamb on the stairwell. Okay, folks. Let me me. In the Venn diagram of life, I'm sorry, Mika and oh, yeah, I have we, an ident. We have an identical stuffed lamb toy from our childhood. And when you crank it, it plays Mary mm. Had a Little Lamb and its head goes back and forth. It did. I yeah. performed surgery on mine because it was too heavy. the too, voice box? I did. I thought it was too heavy. And I, I have a thing about voices, yeah. uh, toys that talk. Yeah. I will tell you the funniest story then. Um, when I was very little, my favorite Muppet was the Count. My father's Fair. a mathematician. My grandmother was an accountant at one point in her life. Yes. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> now, at the same time, I am terrified of vampires as a kid. But the Count was cool. He wasn't a real vampire. He liked numbers. Um, so my parents, recognizing that I love the Count, bought me a Count toy. And it was a stuffed mm-hmm. plush Count. And you pulled the little string on the back and he went, one, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. 
and I was like two or three, and apparently I screamed bloody murder and <laughs> ran away from it, and I wouldn't go near it until they proved to me that the voice thing was cut off. So I have a long tradition of uh, I don't like my toys to talk to me because yeah. that's just not okay, man. <laughs> They're inanimate objects. They shouldn't speak. Yeah, Toy Story freaks me out still. It's a beautiful movie, wonderful story. It's kind of weird. <laughs> Okay. There's a thing I wanted to talk about that I know Rick wanted to talk about. So I'm yeah. going to segue over to the Cleveland Guardians. Back to my childhood. Back to your childhood and to yes. like modern day because well, and to, it is into yesterday. <laughs> and to yesterday, but it, yes. it's very recent, really. Yes. That the Cleveland Guardians have a name that we can say out loud without this. shaking our heads and being like, what were you thinking? So. Uh, as Cammie mentioned, I'm a fourth generation Guardians fan. Uh, Great Grandpa Julius, mm -hmm. Grandma Taffy, Dad, me. By the way, Taffy was not her given name, but that's just what everybody called her. And I never I called her called Grandma. I called my Grandma Jimmy. So, yeah. I called her Grandma once to get her attention when she was being particularly <laughs> stubborn. And boy, did it work. Um, she was so I mad. I she didn't like that very much. No, no not at all. No. But, you know, she recognized why I did it. Um, I grew up listening to baseball on the radio, sometimes watching it. I uh, went to baseball games with my dad. When I moved out to Chicago, by living by myself, I decided to take myself to uh, baseball games at then Comiskey Field because it was five bucks for women on Mondays. <laughs> I had no money, so five bucks for an evening of entertainment for that's like four hours. That seems like a great, yeah. and it's a buck on yeah. the train cool yeah. two bucks if you get a round trip um and but i'm a longtime cleveland baseball fan uh and around the time the cleveland now guardians uh went to the world series for the first time in my lifetime which was in the 90s um i was in college and they were the cleveland indians with a horrifically racist mascot uh, logo called Chief Wahoo, who was a caricature of a Native American. And that was kind of the first time that I recognized, oh, this is not just kind of ha-ha bad. This is a terrible name. And uh, internally, I stopped calling them the Indians. I started calling them the Cleveland baseball team. Um, my family, being given to puns and stupid things, uh, have often referred to Cleveland <laughs> as Cleveburg because there's Hamburg and Cleveland and we just thought Cleveburg was funny. Uh, so I started calling them the Cleveland Cleveburgers. Come to the advent of autocorrect, they became the Cleveland Cheeseburgers because autocorrect <laughs> decided that's what it was. We all thought that was so damn hilarious. I just kept calling them the Cheeseburgers. So I had not called them by their proper name for gosh a good 10 years uh when they announced we're now the cleveland guardians and i know so many people are like what but if you grew up in cleveland and in my defense i only lived there until i was like six or seven i went back all the time for family um there are these kind of art deco -y I always used to imagine that they were designed by the dwarves from Lord of the Rings. They're like that kind of style. Um, statues kind of, uh, of one of them's holding a truck, one of them's holding a car and they're called the guardians of traffic. And they're on this bridge that goes right past the baseball field. And the minute they said guardians and they showed those, I was like, Oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. The guardians of traffic. And, you mm -hmm. know, we can joke that guardians meant that they removed two letters and added four, or and added three, actually, G-U-A-R. And now, ha, 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 the name has changed. It was the mm -hmm. least number of letters to change everything. Um, but really, the name suits, the, suits Cleveland. And I know there are a lot of people in Cleveland who are still upset about this. And I know that there are a lot of people outside of Cleveland who are thrilled that it's changed. And I happen mm -hmm. to be one of the people that is delighted of the new name. I, I find... Empathy is a hard thing for the world, <laughs> you know, and recognizing that you're wrong and that you've made a mistake. And in the case of Cleveland, one for, you know, like a hundred years, like the, the old story. Ah, yes, we named it for a Native American who played for us 
uh, Sox Alexis. But the thing is, is if you start looking into that, the story never held up. Yeah, and that doesn't check out. Right. And mind you, pre-internet, yeah. it was a little bit difficult to look that up. Once the internet became a thing, you know, mid-90s, all of a sudden you had access to all this. Uh, Cleveland would not show you, for example, the protests about the name if you watched the Cleveland television. And since we were listening on the radio when we weren't in Cleveland or reading the newspaper because we literally couldn't get the game in California, you, know, you, you didn't know. And when it hit the World Series, though, that was when the regular news started talking about it. And that was sort of how I figured this out. And maybe that's why I'm like, okay with admitting when I screw up now is that like, hmm. I saw that mistake and I saw how it was hurting people when it wasn't corrected. And I thought, oh, that's not cool. Uh, I'm, I'm going to own up to my mistakes. Well, that and Taffy was pretty big on, if you mess up, just be honest. It'll go a lot better for you. <laughs> and she's not wrong. We just uh, got real deep there in case I anyone know. missed it. That Sorry. Was like some like deeply rooted childhood trauma that like surfaced as Mika being a loving and responsible adult. A lot of the reasons that I'm a good person is that I'm embarrassed of the things that I did or didn't do <laughs> as a kid. Yeah, Rick laughs, but like, okay. Um, I went to boarding Rick laughs school because he understands. <laughs> yeah. I went to, I went to boarding school for three years. Our, we were talking about mascots at some point, And I said that my mascot was the Oak tree. Uh, <laughs> Not a great mascot for a high school. Fighting oaks. What are they fighting? Forest fires. We we ha we didn't have a mascot. Light. We just wore the oak They're tree on our uniforms blight. and called it a day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm on the train coming. I used to take the train. It was in Santa Barbara. And at the time, there was a train station in the town that I lived in. It no longer exists. I lived in a town called Del Mar, which is in Southern California. It's got a racetrack. It's quietly famous. Um, and the, it had a tiny, smaller than my apartment train station. And I would get off at the train station and walk from the train station back to my house. My parents wouldn't pick me up because why bother? You know, it, it's 10 blocks. I can walk that. Um, but I'm on the train coming down from Santa Barbara. And around the time we hit Los Angeles, which is the halfway point, I remember this so very clearly. There was a uh, an Asian uh, a Asian pair of old ladies, little old ladies, you know, 80 years old, all stooped over with canes and the whole nine yards. And they were sitting in front of me and they got up to go to the club car or whatever and get a drink. And when they came back, this grumpy old guy had come in and sat down on their seats and they didn't speak very good English. So they had a very hard time explaining what was going on. And I didn't speak up when the conductor came by. Somebody else did eventually. Um, but I remember so clearly thinking I should say something. I should say something. They were there first. These are their tickets. Uh, I ended up giving up my seat to them so they could sit, which is nice of me. But at the same time, you know, it was always in the back of my head. I should have done something better. And I talked to my dad about it afterwards when I got home. He's like, so how was the train ride? I said, well, this thing happened, dad. And he said, well, what are you going to do next time? I said, next time I'm going to speak up. And he said, good, there you go. You've learned. And he, he told me, you know, don't, don't let having made the mistake eat you up. It's hard not to, but yeah. let it help you become better. And you know, I, being encouraged to do better my entire life, not like be successful, but to be to human better. It's still hugely important to me. It's I, I see people double downing on, you know, you called so and so a name that I won't repeat. And I'm a vulgar lady. Uh, you need to step back, take a time out to, to think about your life, buddy, and apologize to this person. And they're like, no, I'm right and he's wrong and I'm going to call him whatever I want. I'm like, well, see, now this is why you get kicked out of places. Yeah. And it's hard to admit you're wrong. It's hard to recognize your own flaws and the mistakes you've made and then actually change. Uh, but it's important. We got to do it. How are we going to yeah. make a better world? Which I'm aware is a totally deep Jewish thing of we are not concentrating in making a better afterlife we're concentrating in making the world better for today so the next person has it easier 
that we make a better world for everybody. Don't concern yourself with the world to come, concern yourself with this world. And it's just kind of been a fundamental part of my meanness my entire life. So yeah. Sorry, that I went deep again. That and I don't, call Taffy, I like Mika. don't call Taffy grandma. You no, call don't Taffy call Taffy. Taffy. No. No, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she had heart surgery and they were trying to wake her up. And apparently the way they wake you up from a being deep under is to say your name a bunch of times, you know, but her given name was Harriet. And so this poor guy is sitting there next to her going, Harriet, Harriet, wake <laughs> up. And nothing's happening. And he's starting to get worried. And the doctor walks in and says, try telling her, ta- try calling her Taffy. And he goes, Taffy? And she sat up. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah. <laughs> Don't call her Harriet. Kathy no, was an no grandma, person. no Harriet. Check. Yeah. Check, check. Tappy. Check. She was she Sorry, was happy. Nah, she think it's funny now. She's got a glass okay. of Chardonnay and is probably loving the fact that I cross stitch vulgarities. <laughs> I have to say, the favorite cross stitch I own is a vulgarity cross stitched mm-hmm. by Mika, so yeah, it's got skulls and roses on it. Which it was free handed. It was and roses and profanity. It was, it like was free handed. I, yeah. I was looking at a picture of a rose and I just started cross stitching it. I'm like, hey, that actually worked out. I'm kind of spoiled. So I'm going to let our listeners in on a little secret. We were recording oh, yeah. earlier. We got halfway <laughs> yeah. through the episode and realized <laughs> yeah. that we weren't recording anymore. So we have no idea what content we've recorded and what content we haven't recorded. So I want to throw back to the banana slugs, damn it. <laughs> that was in the previous recording. I know for sure. I know. It, uh, I know it was, but we didn't get to talk about the banana slugs. I feel like no. all of Rick's great research. Let's, let's also say this. If you've never had your partner research one of your best friends, it's a trippy experience. And I have now experienced it. And I feel I like wound up down a... Rick's great research. No, it's being it was mostly UC to, Santa I want to, I want to Cruz. hear about the rabbit yeah. hole that you have to go down. I mean, I know I'm the only Mika Epstein on the planet. I, I hope I'm the I, only Mika Epstein well, on the planet. Yeah, I mean, most of it was I clued. In, I know the banana slugs, so I clued in to the the UC Santa Cruz banana slugs, and and we had an awful mascot at, at our college. And so that resonated with me. And then I was like, well, what else went on in Santa Cruz that might've been interesting to Mika at the time? And really the only other thing I could come up with was the blue lagoon. And I don't know if you ever went you to didn't the blue go to lagoon. Lost Boys? I would, no, I would I would, you, to Lost that's Boys. Santa, that's Santa Carla. Carla. Let's, let's be straight. But it was filmed Santa in Carla. Santa Cruz. Yeah. It was filmed in Santa Cruz. I don't Cruz, believe you. Carla. The the I've dude with the, the dude with the I, the dude with the saxophone, have, the guy with the saxophone is in Santa Carla. I've been there, Santa Cruz. I've seen it. I've stood where next, he stood. If you haven't next, you're going to tell me hard, next. You're going to tell me that Zena was filmed in New Zealand. Oh no, no, it was filmed in ancient was, Greece. Ancient Greece. Yeah. See, that's what I'm, I'm saying. Kind of Santa, Santa Carla. Cameras. For everybody confused, I went to UC Santa Cruz, uh, University of California in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz oh, is, slugs. the mascot is the banana slugs. And the chancellor, the first day I was there, told us the joke of because banana slugs don't have knees, Santa Cruz doesn't have a football team because it would be unfair. There's nothing to tackle. <laughs> and that joke just kind of stuck in my head. Um, I went to Santa, I went to UC Santa Cruz for two years uh, before I dropped out. Sorry, mom. Um, and I studied anthropology and creative writing. With a, How with have a, those studies been useful to your everyday life, Minka? Uh, I still write. Okay. Uh, I like to, I, I write for myself. Uh, I'm writing a mystery for myself. I'm also hmm. writing a story that is kind of me dealing with my dad's death. Uh, my father died four years ago and I'm still messed up about it. Uh, because it was totally unexpected. Didn't see it coming. Just got a phone call at 1030 at night from my stepmom in Japan saying, you know, your, your, uh, your dad can't talk. He'd had a stroke. Uh, and that was fundamentally world changing for me. I've not been the same person ever since, but UC Santa Cruz was a dippy, dorky, hippie place. I mean, it's just, one of my classmates 
after a class. She said, I'm going to go for a walk and just walked into the woods. And I didn't see her till another three days. And then she popped back up <laughs> wearing the same clothes. And she said, yeah, that was fun. And that was pretty normal there. Yeah. Uh, so I like, I loved UC Santa Cruz, but uh, creative writing, I still write. Uh, mm -hmm. Anthropology, I was actually kind of leaning towards forensic anthropology. I really oh, like, yes. yeah. Well, now that's that th I was contemplating transferring to McGill. McGill has where the books about bones take place. And the woman who wrote them was a lecturing professor in McGill. And my mother being Canadian citizen at the time, my plan was to activate my dual citizenship and get a, you know, cheap college education. Uh, circumstances being what they were, I ended up moving to Chicago and getting involved in the dot-com bubble instead. You know, life takes a weird path. But anthropology really actually helps me, I think, because one of the things that you have to do in anthropology when you're, well, at least at Santa Cruz, is that you had to take both uh, practical anthropology, which was understanding the physicality of, how, of evolution and how things become other things. But then you also had to take um, kind of social anthropology, which was understanding how different cultures have family units and why are some matriarchal and why are some patriarchal? Why do some do this? Why do some do that? And you, you had to learn those things because they directly related to the work of forensic anthropology in the end because you know if you know that a specific culture does a certain thing as a beauty mark like has a very large lip or have uh, piercings in bone which some of them do uh then you know when you see certain injuries on a body oh that's not a killing injury that's not a wound this is from the culture that they were in so it's hugely important um and working in tech the way that I do, it keeps my brain open to everybody's going to come to, you know, WordPress, for example, from a different place. Uh, everybody comes starting from a different spot. Some people came because they started writing code. Some people were writing and wanted a way to put a spoiler tag on an article they were working on. That would be me. Um, and learned to code just to get that there because you couldn't find it. Um, but because we all come from different places, the way in which we write code is different. The way we implement concepts are different. And even to this day, when I'm reviewing somebody else's code, having that in the back of my head to remember, you know, well, where did this person come from? Okay, that explains why this design goes this way. I can kind of start to recognize what culture someone's in just by reading their code. And, you know, my friend Jan, uh, Jan makes fun of me about that sometimes. He's like, how did you know this was so-and-so just by looking at the code format? And I'm like, because he has a very distinctive code formatting. And by the way, if you've ever watched Leverage and you just thought, hey, wait, very distinctive, was that a joke back to Elliot? The answer is yes. I love Leverage. It's one of my favorite shows. Good show. Filmed in Portland. Portland? Yeah, yeah I was going to say Portland a couple of filmed. Seasons. Yeah. It's not yeah. it's not set in Portland. It's just filmed. It is for the yeah. last two filmed seasons. Here. Yeah. Oh, it, it's set. They moved it, then moved it to being in Portland for the last two seasons. They filmed the first episode in Chicago, filmed in LA, went to Boston, came back to Portland. Uh, whole thing. We, my wife and Weren't I, have they... just actually rewatched the whole series, so that's why it's fresh in my mind. They, Weren't they, they filmed reboot, in our, rebooting in it. So, oh man, so you... yeah, it was really exciting. I miss that about mm. Chicago <laughs> because like in, I live now, I, now I live near LA, all the filming, they're just going to, they barely go out. They do it all on so sets. They build stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. But when I was in Chicago, get off the train, you're walking past filming. Uh, there was this TV show. A guy got the newspaper a day ahead, early edition. That's the show. Uh, this guy was filming it at the local police station. So I'm like walking past it. Um, I'm in a director's cut of a movie as girl on rollerblades, actually but nice. it's almost impossible to find me. Like you just see like the edge of my shirt. And for extra fun, I was wearing a Cleveland baseball jersey at the time, which is probably why they didn't focus on me. Fair enough. Early, ed Goodbye, early edition, of course. Early edition, of course, based on the laws of Back to the Future. Like don't, don't read anything. Don't take anything. Hmm. All, all on that premise. Yeah, he'd get the newspaper a day ahead of time and then use it to solve the crime he read and thus change the headline, which, you know, when you start thinking about it too much, it gets really creepy. Yep. Yep. I try not I to think even... about. Yeah. I try yeah. not to think about time travel, but 
by default, Tracy dumps all the time travel questions for Les Watch on me. And right now, <laughs> The Flash is doing a time loop, and, and I'm like, I don't want to watch it. I don't want to know. Hi. At space. Talking of time, I believe we're coming yeah, up we're on getting an hour, close. We are. Yeah, Cammie, anything else you wanted to cover, given that this was your first and foremost invite for the show? It was. In case, in case anyone ever wanted to know who the first person I invited to do this show was, it was Mika. I'd make um, hard hands, but I can't. So <laughs> just pretend yeah. I am. That's fine. Also, partly so that we can reserve the right to bring her back on the show later when we actually get our format down, because we don't know what we're doing right now. No. At all. Does anyone? No. Life is no. just no. guessing. Yeah, if somebody had told me adulthood meant that it was just multiple unplanned moments of chaos, not sequentially, but at the same time overlapping, I don't know that I would have been in such a rush to grow up. I would not have. I wasn't, actually. All I deal with but is now I'm moments here. of chaos. <laughs> consecutive overlapping moments of chaos that is life that is yes. life and that was this episode as well hey rick wrap us up yeah, yeah well <laughs> i don't know i don't know how to wrap the show up we don't have a format yet and we've also got this i would also like to um just mention we've been talking over one another but we've got this weird delay with audio so yeah. hopefully hopefully we'll figure that out at some point but um mika you know i i know what a presence you play in cammy's life and getting the chance to just spend some time chatting with you and and learning more about you and sharing it with the folks who listen to the show is has been just a real pleasure indeed. And Kimmy, don't start crying, but uh, we will have you back once this stuff is straightened out. We really appreciate you having the patience. I don't know that I can help to... if it's straightened out. So yeah. I was about oh. to make the joke. Uh, I don't think we want to bring Nico uh, on. It's too straight. I'm just, the, I'm just the straight man. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, anyways, I folks. think we go out. I think we go out on a high note. I think we Thank go out. Thank you on so that. much, Mika. Yeah. Yep. Good to see you. I will happily come back anytime. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.